So, without further ado, I'm going to bring our very first panelist to the stage. Please, can you welcome Linda McGillivray? She is director of Caldera Limited and franchise partner of Platinum Property Partners. Welcome, Linda. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please, can you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yes, so my name is Linda McGillivray. Uh, my husband and I started um, Caldea Limited in March 2020. Um, we convert properties into high quality co-living spaces for um, young professionals. Um, and we joined, because it's our first foray into the property market and it's such a specialised area, we didn't want to do, um, go on the journey, if you like, on our own. There were too many mistakes we could make, so we actively sought out um, some mentoring and we came across Platinum Property Partners um, and decided that actually the, the range of services that they offered was phenomenal and we would make far fewer mistakes and be far more successful if we went with, with them. So we've actually started putting partnership with them. Brilliant, thank you so much. Can I just check everybody can hear us okay as well? Yeah, great. Okay, so next up we have Charlotte Rutter from Roma Finance. Please welcome Charlotte. Hello. Charlotte again, welcome. And thank please you. can you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, hi, um, I'm Charlotte Rutter. I'm the Head of Communications for Roma Finance. Uh, Roma is a bridging lender, very agile, forward-thinking lender, um, here to support property investors and developers in their uh, endeavours. Uh, I've been in communications for 20 years now, <laughs> and um, in, the, in the property and finance industry for approximately seven years now as well. Great. Great, thank you, Charlotte. Next, we have the wonderful Marie Paris. She is CEO of George Ellis Property Services. Welcome, Marie. Looking fabulous, may I add? Right. Marie, please Hi. tell everybody who you are and what you do. Good, okay, so I've been a landlord since 1994. Uh, George Ellis Property Services, my company, started in 2004, but we actually started by giving landlords seminars, training seminars, how you needed to be a landlord without the gloss. So, Mike, okay? Yeah, little, little Sorry glitches. Sorry about that. But right. Without all of the gloss, the multimillionaire stuff, which is rubbish, it's about all of the things that you need to know when you're a self-managed landlord. That's how we started. Organically, we grew with landlords saying to us, could you actually rent our properties? So we let them manage across London. We still do the training courses, which is very much a core part of our business today. And I do various other things with in the industry. Brilliant. Thank you, Marie. And last but certainly not least, we have Carly German, who is Director and Property Legitation Solicitor at Woodstock Legal okay. Services. Thank you, Carly, for joining. Please just tell everybody a little bit about what you do. Um, so, yeah, I'm a lawyer. Um, I specialise in property litigation, but more specifically, and this has been in the last 10 years, just residential landlord and tenant um, services. So anything from evictions, rent arrears recovery, um, housing disrepair claims, which we're seeing a huge increase in unlawful eviction. Um, so I'm a specialist lawyer and I have a team that work with me across England and Wales, also specialists working for landlords and agents across the country. I'm also a landlord myself. I got my first property when I was 25. Um, so I've experienced those same challenges. My, one of my biggest challenges I think I've had has been when my property was cuckooed twice. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that or knows what it is, but it's when county lines drug dealers will move into a property and essentially take it over to run as a drug den, normally where you've got a tenant that's a vulnerable adult, and I've had to deal with that twice. So I understand the, the challenges that landlords face having experienced them myself. Um, and I'm also the CEO um, owner of Woodstock Legal Services, which I set up escaping from traditional law firms with a view to setting up something that allowed me to push my career forward and really provide legal services in a much more progressive way, a much more practical way, um, and provide a platform for other women and men to be able to come on board and do the same thing. 
Amazing, thank you so much, Carly. Well, very excited to be here today. Let's kick off then with uh, our first question. So, I want to start kind of at the very beginning. Um, so, I guess the first question should really be, why as a woman should we invest in property, Marie? Okay, so I definitely feel that as women, the majority of us have natural skills. So, we all run a home, we have children, we pay bills, we're organising works for, um, to be done on our home. These are various different skills that you can take to apply in the different elements of property. Whether you're going to do something like me as a property agent, whether you're going to do something that is a bit detailed, a bit creative, we have that. I also feel that it's really important, whether you're married with partner, that every single woman and every single woman should have a property of their own that is under their name. Absolutely. I'm very much for keeping properties in the family bloodline. Yeah. So I definitely feel it doesn't matter where you want to go to, what type of career you want to have in property, it is varied. We have the skills, we have the natural skills, the communication skills, the admin, the organising. We're people people. Yeah. So I'm very pro that. Yeah, absolutely. Would anybody else like to add on to that? No, yeah, I think I agree. And I, you know, that was my motivation at 25 to get my first property. It was yeah. something for myself. And, that, yeah. you know, um, it's harder to do now. Appreciate that. But that was really important for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And so then, Linda, why do you think that property is such a great career for women to get involved in? Well, actually, sort of following on from what Marie was saying, I think that a lot of women that I've come across, myself included, that when you've taken time out of a career and you've been running a house and you've got children and maybe you're trying to juggle part-time working, running a family, mm -hmm. um, we undervalue the skills that we have by running a home. And I think, you know, I am... Um, I've got managerial skills. I am an extreme multitasker by running a home with three children in it. Um, I'm head of human resources. I'm head of conflict resolution. Um, I'm head of logistics, budgeting. That's right. All sorts of things. And I think that we sometimes fail to recognise just how transferable those skills are in a work environment. And property gives you all of those things you know I'm having to deal with builders and I'm having to, and they're actually no different to dealing with bickering children or the kids in the playground <laughs> that I used to have to deal with um, you know I've got to deal with budgeting I've got to bring a project in on time or it's not going to make me money um, it also suits me because I can um, I'm very much a project person and that's not just because I'm female mm -hmm. it's because you know, it, it suits my character, but there's an ebb and flow in the sort of work that we do. We're refurbishing a property, so it's yep. really, really busy. And yep. then we have a bit of calm and quiet. So then I can do the other things that are important to me. Yeah. Um, and it gives me the flexibility as well. Family is massively important. And it mm -hmm. means that running my own business, being in the property, I can drop what I, what, what I need to for the kids. And just because mine are in their 30s doesn't mean they need me any less than they did when they were six. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. so it means that I've got that flexibility. Yeah, we, we're natural born problem solvers, aren't we, as women? Especially when children come in, every day there's a new problem, every day yeah. there's something else to solve. So those skills are 100% transferable, I, I totally agree there. So then talking about finance and females, mm. uh, do you think that property and finance company Charlotte could benefit from having more women involved, but more importantly, also in senior positions? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, anything in the property, uh, the property industry, in the finance industry, legal, anything like that, it's yeah. always traditionally been a really male-dominated industry. Um, there are, in the finance industry, about half of financial services employees are actually we uh, women, but there's not very many still in the senior positions. Um, so, women do tend to be, you know, not to generalise, obviously, but they tend to be more um, sensitive, more agile, more focused on development, on, on knowledge, on, um, on education as well. Mm. So they have a great ability to be able to bring, develop people into the industry and create all those opportunities. And women need to advocate for each other on, in whatever industry it is. Um, 
but um, just picking up on your point about family life too. So yeah. you have your own business. I am part of um, a, a larger lender, but they have been amazing and instrumental in being able to allow me to have everything. So I have my family. I don't miss any nativities or sports days or anything like that, but still be able to influence the lives of uh, many people out there, property investors too. Um, Roma is fantastic um, on uh, service, customer service and how we treat people. And it just all flows through. But yeah, there's yeah. women in senior positions at Roma, which is definitely filtered down and created considerable success. Yeah, that's, that's really great to hear. What do you think some obstacles are for women getting into senior positions, not just in finance, but you know, in any business? I think because the industry previously was very male dominated, mm. I think women have just thought they needed to fit into that box, into that little narrow box of what it used to be. Mm. And this, this can apply to, to property, to um, uh, anything in that sort of area. Yeah. Um, whereas if you play to your strengths and you're bold and you do it, do you, just do you and yeah. do it how you want to do it, you will probably find that you have considerably more success. I know some amazing women who left their career, decided they wanted something different, and they've now, um, you know, portfolio landlords, having, um, you know, a great work-life balance and, and doing it the way they want to do it. And it never would have been possible if they just tried to fit into the traditional box that was perhaps there in the, you know, the 80s and the 90s. It's a, it's a whole new way of doing things now. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Super inspirational they are. So Carly then, from a legal perspective, what's it like being a female in law? Yeah, I think it's probably really similar. Um, yeah. There's no getting, uh, lawyers, I think we're, there's probably more female lawyers, I think. I'd have to check the stats, but, <laughs> but again, um, there's a barrier at the top. Um, women aren't progressing. If you look at the top of law firms, you know, they're predominantly male-led. Um, I think for me, I look back, um, Woodstock's really different because we're a female-led firm and also a lot of my team, um, majority are self-employed. Um, right. They attract entrepreneurial lawyers, men and women, yeah. um, but it really suits women because they're able to push their careers forward as I wanted to, mm. whilst having that flexibility and the ability to juggle that alongside a family. It also attracts you know, men that want to do the same and that are supporting women do the same. We've got a lot of male consultant lawyers, fantastic lawyers, um, but they too want to do the school run. Um, their wife works, so they're there doing it jointly. So it's, it's not failing to recognize those. And I think I'm in a privileged position being at Woodstock um, because we've kind of flipped it on its head um, a little bit. And you've got um, men and women succeeding in that environment, taking away that ceiling. Um, and it's, it's looking back, when I look at the traditional law firm that I was in before, one female partner, I look at that firm still, still that one female partner, nobody else has pushed through, they've left. Yeah. Um, and it's really frustrating. And it, I'm okay in a male environment, I quite enjoy a male environment. I grew up with two brothers, um, I'm quite comfortable in it, but I appreciate a lot of people might not be. Yeah. And I think you're right, it's that feeling of just trying to fit into that male world. And sometimes it was like, perhaps could you penetrate it, that little, the little gang as much as you, mm -hmm. you, know, you should have been able to, perhaps if there was more women. If you're working as a lawyer in property, a lot of the surveyors you work with are male. The, there's a lot of male lawyers, but it's, it's the people you're working alongside, the experts that you work with tend to be male. A lot of the property investor clients tend to be male. Yeah. I would love, and I think with Woodstock, we've we flipped it on its head and we're making a change. I'd love to see surveyors doing the same thing, and I'd love to see more female property investors for, you know, for my team to work with. I think yeah. that would be you know, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, there was less choice a, a little while ago, wasn't there? You know, women did tend to bring up the kids, go home, take the maternity leave. It wasn't even an option once for guys to have a long paternity leave. Mm. That's all changed now, right? I know more and more people where the guys are choosing to be a stay-at-home dad and the women are going back to work quicker. Yeah. So I think now we've got more options in that sense as well from a finance perspective of having a family. That's going to give more opportunity to women yeah. and to have more of a career. I think know? there's a self-belief issue as well because I think yeah. that when you take time out of the workplace, 
you think, oh, well, I can't go back in. I've had time out. I've only been looking after the children. Mm -hmm. And I think we tend to look at jobs and go, I can't do that, so I won't try. I won't go for it. Mm. Whereas men often go, well, I can do some of it, so I'll give the rest of it a go. Mm. Um, so I, th I think there's, I think innately there's a, we, we prevent ourselves from getting yeah. into some of these positions. Yeah, Marie, did you have yeah, something? Yeah, I there? wanted to say, I mean, look, some of us are not corporate people. We're yes. just not. And we don't want to be. And I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, before I got into property and the jobs that I did have, I don't think there was one job that I had for two years or even 18 months. Um, I'm just not that corporate girl. So if you find that you have the ability, mm. you've got some confidence, you don't need to have a lot of confidence because when you start something, you will hone in on that. Start your own thing because then you don't have to worry about the silly office politics and somebody not promoting you because and you're only getting a percentage of the fee that the firm is making. Start your own thing. Mm. It, may seem daunting but it's not mm. because once you start and you realize i don't have a safety net and i've never had a safety net i am the safety net yeah. you learn to just cope with that yeah. because you don't have a second option why be in any establishment where you're not happy why it yeah. makes no sense yeah. it's definitely since COVID, no. So if any of you are sitting there and you're thinking, do you know what, I want to start something in property. And there are many things you can do. Interior, property sourcing, property management, do legal, do finance, but start something. Yeah. People buy you. They don't buy that brand over the door. When I worked for other people, and my day job before property, I was in recruitment, they would buy me. They did not buy my employer's business. So mm. consequently, when I got the courage to leave, all of my clients came with me. Yeah. So don't be put off by if you want to start something yourself. Absolutely. Corporate's and if you don't know where to start, seek a coach, seek a mentor, mm. get the right network of people around you. That was life-changing for me. I messed around for a year or two, kind of stumbling my way through things. I had no idea about property. I was a dancer beforehand. And uh, I so sought mentorship, and that was when everything changed for me. So that would be a huge piece of advice if I could give uh, anybody thinking about starting out today. Okay, well, let's talk now about some positives in the industry because there are <coughs> many, many, many of those. What would you say has been a career highlight for you since starting your business, Marie? I think there's been many. I mean, I've been speaking on the property circuit for about 18 years. I know I like people to think I'm about 42, but I just give the game away when I say that. <laughs> But the thing is, I was in the audience here, and actually, funny enough, I don't know who she was, but she was a solicitor, <laughs> and she was doing a seminar, and what she was talking about, I remember sitting there, and I remember thinking, what? What is she saying? And I'm like thinking, I could do better than that. <laughs> so literally, I left that seminar, contacted the organizers, and the next show I was on. And Amazing. that's how I started to speak. So I built my business, by giving seminars, landlords then grew it organically by saying, would you let them manage my properties? And I was speaking. So I did three different elements, and then we have just added onto that. I think my highlights, my, my, my positive points, are when I'm creating something, and I create that, that thing, that business, that is turns into money mm -hmm. because you know what is a business a business is solving a problem for a profit and if you're an investor you're a landlord that is what you're meant to do so I have many high um, highlights but I think that opportunities are around us every single time it's just about you identifying it and, and going for it yeah absolutely what about anybody else anybody got a career highlight yeah I think um for me, it was um, the ability to, with Woodstock Legal Services, step away from a traditional law firm and find a way to really push my own career progression alongside having children. 
and satisfy my sort of entrepreneurial and creative flair that, and ambitions that I had alongside legal practice um, yeah. and really create something that I was proud of. And it's years and years of hard work, but where the team now is starting to be recognized as, you know, key players, we've just been shortlisted for the awards of this show for um, land or legal service provider. So for myself and the team to get that recognition and start to really, really recognize us up there, you know, a firm that's relatively junior compared to yeah. some others is, is incredibly rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Carry, carrying on them from the motherhood um, type yeah. of topic that we've got, what would you say, Linda, how have you managed to navigate through uh, motherhood and a career in property? Well, I think I, when I was, when my children were younger, so my husband and I, between us, have six children, which is way more than anybody needs, and they <laughs> range from sort of 12 to, to 30, and when my three were young, I was working part-time, and I was a mum part-time, so I spent my entire life, or my children's entire life, feeling guilty that I was a rubbish mum, and I wasn't able to work and do, and do the job that I wanted to do. Mm. With the business that we've got now, I can fit everything around what's important to me, which is the family, but it's also about making sure that I can put, bring my values into our business. So of the children that we have, five of them have been in rented accommodation, either through university or apprenticeships, or um, they've, they've, they're sort of privately renting through work. So I've seen a whole range of properties that they've lived in and thinking, well, I don't really want them living in places like that. And if my children are going to move away and work somewhere else, I'd like to know that their landlords actually care about them and that they're going to be in decent accommodation and that if something goes wrong, it will be fixed and sorted. So um, with all of the properties that we've got, um, I actually shamelessly exploit my children and just go, OK, this is, you're the age group that we're aiming for. What do you want in a property? What would you be looking for? Mm. Do you like this colour scheme? Um, what, what's trending now? Because what I think at my age is the in thing is probably about 10 years out of date for the youngsters, because um, you know, I'm a bit slow to catch on. So I do, um, we, we, all of the experiences, if, if we moved from job to job in the commercial world, we would be taking those experiences that we'd had previously and bringing them into our current role. But for some reason, as I said earlier, for some reason we seem to think that being at home and running a home successfully isn't actually working and it doesn't give you anything to bring into your business. Mm. But there's a hu everything that we do, mm. you know, everything that we, um, that we experience, all the issues that we have, I've managed to bring into, into the environment. But I think for me, the biggest thing, going back to the self-confidence thing that I mentioned earlier, yeah. for me, this was a huge jump into a, into a very complex world. Um, and it is fraught with difficulties and, it's, and there's a huge amount of legislation involved around it. And so for me, the safety net of, have, of being part of a, of a very well respected franchise network where there are other people who have done the same thing across the country. Yeah. A, it gave me confidence that the model would work. And also it gave me somewhere that I knew I could go, that if I wasn't too sure on something, I've got a panel of people that I can go even if they won't actually do it for me. Because, you know, when, you, when the kids come to you and they're little and they go, Mum, how do you do? And you go, well, how do you think it works? Which is a really annoying question. But Platinum will do the same. It's like, well, what do you think about things? Or this is where you need to go for advice. So mm -hmm. I think having that safety net has actually helped to build my confidence far quicker than if I'd done what you'd done yeah. and invested without a mentor. Yeah. And then think, crikey, I'm, a, I'm in above, over my head here and I don't know where to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think, you know, for me, it's, a lot of it is about the flexibility. Yes. Um, yeah, flexibility is a great word to use. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Because I can go... Um, and I think I bring something different. I think women generally bring something different. We have a different perspective on the world. And, that, and I know that yeah, there's obviously an overlap between the way men and women think and act and everything. But I think we, we maybe approach things in a slightly different way. We, our emphasis is on something slightly different. So, for example, my husband's emphasis is most definitely on the bottom line. Mine is, does the lounge look nice? Mm. Um, you know, would, would, would our housemates be comfortable here? And as a result of that marrying of two different sets of perspectives we've got very stable households so we then don't have the churn of housemates that yeah. maybe people who 
care less about their tenants yeah. who are just in okay. it for the money. We, 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 we have people who stay and who work together and we've got happy households. Great, great stuff. Okay, Charlotte, the industry has changed a lot. I know that you have had an excellent career in finance that stemmed a few years now. How would you say the industry has changed over those years for women? Um, I think the industry has been evolving considerably, both property and finance has been evolving for a very long time. I think the last three years specifically has given people a new perspective on life. So there's a number of options here. There's, there's so many more people that are empowered and have, they've, whether they've come across that themselves and seen, yeah, I, I can do that better and, and taken, taken that leap. Um, but in another way, in the last three months alone, 250,000 people of working age left the UK workforce. So there are nine million now of work that could work that are, are not working, but they have, for, for various reasons, many, many reasons, um, but for some of them, it's because they want a different way of life and they want to go out on their own, they want to create their own destiny, they want to have everything. Um, so whether they've done that or um, that in turn has made um, it a very much a, a worker's market. So there are companies have to have raised their standard. Um, they have to do better for people. They have to provide that good life work, work life balance. Yeah. Um, so I think in the normal side of technology getting better, um, there's much more diversity and inclusion across the board, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, I think it's just everybody's had to do better yes. because people know what yeah. there wasn't any um, sort of realization of what they were missing before COVID. And then everybody went, oh, wow, I don't have to um, I don't have to work nine to five, five days a week. I don't have to work late into the night. I can have everything. I don't have to go to the office. Yeah. Um, so I think everybody has to do better to yeah. get the best people in. Yeah, mm -hmm. again, coming back to that word flexibility, yeah. as we spoke about before. Carly, would you say the same in terms of law? Yeah, um, lawyers are very slow on the uptake, I have to admit. I think law firms are a little bit archaic compared to other industries. Um, okay. So change is really slow, but it is happening. I think um, the pandemic helped a huge amount yeah. um, for us, um, for lawyers. Um, and I think the rise in consultancy. So um, over half of my team are self-employed. And I think that really gives the flexibility um, that women need and men. So not to shut up, but that yes. parents need. And older men as well. I've got some um, older members. I think I shouldn't say that. They're over there. Um, but, you know, they want that flexibility. They want to go on holiday with their wife. They've been working in law firms where they've worked really long hours for years. And they want to, you know, it's time to spend with the family. Mm -hmm. But for women, it, it is changing. Um, and I've got two sides here. I won't point them out. But two. Um, a newly qualified solicitor and a trainee and for me it's really important that not just for the, my self-employed team that I've got an environment where they can continue to flourish as mums and as females and that you, they lead the way and hopefully because they're in a firm that is not male-led and is female-led they can see that the opportunity is there it's still incredibly hard no matter mm. how much you know we can all talk about the positives it's incredibly hard but we are making a change and, and things are progressing and yeah. they're going the right way could go a little bit quicker, but they're going the right way. Good, good. Yeah. Now, obviously, we've spoke about a lot of advantages. There are tons of advantages for why you should invest. What are some of the disadvantages that we have come across during our careers? I know there are plenty. Hopefully, they're getting fewer and fewer. But Marie, what would you say some of the disadvantages or obstacles that you've come across uh, within your career? Okay, so when I first of all started to invest in 1994, mm -hmm. my very first property that I bought then was repossessed. Okay. Yeah. So that was probably about sort of four years later. Um, and it was a really, really big time for me. Uh, there's lots behind the story, which I won't go into. The thing that... I think lets landlords down is not having the knowledge. Yeah. Mm. Now, yeah. no offence. Yeah. 
Um, and I'd love you as a lawyer because I like lawyers who are also <laughs> investors. And yes. I do like particularly female lawyers. Yeah. But herein lies, okay? We are getting into a season that is going to be very difficult for us as landlords. Landlords need to educate themselves. There are lots of evictions yes. that you're going to have to do. They are probably going to charge you £2,000 <laughs> to do the eviction. <laughs> It's not that much. Okay. <laughs> and that's the eviction, probably even just part of it. You guys as landlords need to know that process. You need to know how to fill out an N5B form. As an letting agent, I can't do it for you. But you need to know how to fill it out and you need to get the education. And I think that is very, very important. Mm. Too many times I have landlords that sit on my training courses, whether you've got two, seven more properties, some of the fundamentals you do not know. You can't just run and just decide I'm going to invest in a property because mm. my friend Sue is doing it. Don't worry about Sue. What are you doing? So I think it's the education. You're letting yourself down on that and you're not getting to a point where you are knowledgeable. And this is going to be the season where you have to be. Build it from the bottom upwards. It's like if you're building a brick wall. If you don't have that mix of sand and cement, you're going to lean on that wall and that wall is going to fall down. So educate yourself. Applied knowledge is what I say. Not knowledge that you pick up from the internet or on the street. Applied knowledge. Why are you doing it? The why and the how. Because when you learn the why, it will become very easy mm. to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, Linda, you didn't actually have any construction background or experience when you first started out in property. How challenging was that for you? And what steps did you take so that you did gain that knowledge? Well, it wasn't actually as difficult as you might think because I, um, I just ask lots of questions all the time. Um, yeah. And that comes from my dad who always used to say to me, never accept anything for what you're being told. Always ask why. You need to understand why it is you are expected to do something. Yeah. Um, I think with builders, one of, the, one of the advantages of being a woman is that builders generally don't actually expect you to know an awful lot about what the building trade involves, which sometimes works in your favor because they're happy for you to ask questions. I think the minute you start bluffing, they can spot that a mile off. Yeah. But I found that, I mean, my building team now is absolutely amazing and we're now talking the same language because it's like, you know, I go and procure all the materials for them. So the plumber says, right, okay, you know, we're gonna put, we need, we, you know, I, I need to get the sinks, for example. When I first started out, I'd have got the sink. I realised I probably need a plug and a tap, but I might have forgotten that, or I might not have understood that I needed an S bend or that particular clip. Whereas now I do, and that's because I've chatted to them and I understand what it is that that they need. Um, I did have a little bit of a background because, um, I mean, right from a young age, my dad was building extensions in our houses and I was labouring for him and I sort of still labour now. Um, and I worked in the construction insurance industry for a while at a time okay. when I was very young and, yeah. and actually it was incredibly male dominated and I had a bit of a rough time. So I said, okay, no, I don't know the difference between a board pile and a driven pile, so take me on site and then I'll understand it. So I think for me, it's about, um, you, you can ask questions. You only actually have one opportunity. And I, when I was teaching, I always used to say this to the kids. When you're, when you're 16, you can ask any question because nobody expects you to know anything. But as you get older, you feel that you can't ask questions because you should know the answer and you feel stupid for saying you don't know. Yeah. Um, but you, and I, th I think once you've been in an environment, if you've missed the opportunity to ask the question to educate yourself, mm -hmm. then, then that opportunity has been lost and you're on the back foot. Yeah. But I think for me, it's like, reckon, I've got skills that the builders don't have. It's like, I get, I bake cakes. The builders like my cakes and I get some good work out of them. Okay, we can't all be good at everything that we do. And yeah. I can't build a house myself. I need their skills. And it's about recognizing where your skills gaps are. Yeah and filling them with the right people. Yeah, so I guess those disadvantages where you are missing knowledge or you're missing certain things would be to build a team 
that has those things that you're yeah. ne needing, right? Yeah. Fill in a missing piece in a jigsaw puzzle, as Absolutely. we say. And also yeah. go with your gut instinct as well. I mean, I, in, in our last build, um, we had an issue with the builder and I knew it was going wrong and he was a friend of ours and we'd taken as many steps as we could to avoid having those potential problems if, if things didn't work out. Yeah. And I knew things were going wrong and, and I left it and I left it because I thought, oh no, he's having a bad time, always had COVID, always a friend, all, yeah, I don't want to upset the apple cart. And actually it went more wrong than it needed to because I didn't trust myself. So yeah, I think so it's com a confidence, confidence thing there. Yeah, and again, going back, and I know I've said it already, but having the benefit of the, uh, of the, of the of platinum behind us means that, you know, I don't need to get into problems. If I come across something that I haven't come across before, I can phone the lettings manager or I can phone the planning people yeah. and I can say, right, okay, this is coming up. Mm. What do I need to do about it? Where do I need to go? What have I got to be aware of? So I'm actually cutting... I'm cutting problems off. I'm heading problems off before they actually With become people. an issue. Yeah, brilliant. Marie, can you add anything to that? In terms of what? In terms of um, where the disadvantages have come from with regards to builders and how you would try and mitigate, I guess, those problems before they've come about. I think that really you have answered, and I think one of the things, the key things that I take from you is that to ask those questions yeah. before, it's about doing your due diligence. Yeah. You know, without any due diligence, you end up in a, a situation that you're not meant to end up yeah. that will cost you a lot more. Yeah. You know, uh, buying the property is easy. Well, relatively, it used to be relatively easy, not so easy now. But doing up the property, refurbishing that property, there are a number of things that you need to find out before you go down that road. The whole planning, the consent, what are you using that property for? What's going to be the end use? An HMO, how many tenants you're putting in there? It's about the due diligence. So it comes back to the knowledge is what I'm trying to instill. When you don't have the knowledge and you've got a wealth of knowledge right here. When I started, they didn't have things like this. They didn't have things like this. They had Mike Stimson and um, a landlord association. You've got lots of people here that can help you, but it's the knowledge, but getting the right knowledge from the right people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you know, two people in the same industry may not agree. You've got to work with what you feel you're more aligned with. But I keep them punching on that because that is why I lost my property. And I don't plan to lose one in this season. So it's the knowledge. Great. Thank you I very think much. Planning as well is always good. You know, mm. I've always said, if you, if you if you spend time up front planning, and I plan for probably more eventualities than there are likely to be. So I do have plan A and B, I'm probably up to G and H and a bit beyond there on occasions. But I'm not going to be surprised then, and I can turn, I can flip quite quickly to another option. So I think sometimes people just go headlong into something and don't think about the bigger picture. Yeah. Um, so I do think planning is actually an important yeah, part. Yeah, great. Thank you. So Charlotte then, let's talk mental health and balance. How have you found your career in finance? Has there been times where that scale has tipped one way? Um, and how, how do you cope with the workload while maintaining balance in life? Um, Things changed, yeah, things changed dramatically in, in 2020. Um, and it, mental health was all over the newspapers. It was, um, you know, it, it should have been focused on more beforehand, but it really came to the forefront of everything. So I think uh, for, men, for my mental health specifically, um, knowledge, absolutely, agility and self-care, those yeah. are the three things that have got me through and I think will continue to do so. Um, I think this has been the most turbulent three years. I mean, we've had a pandemic, we've had a war, we're on multiple prime ministers and counting. Let's just see how it goes. Um, you can't control these things. You've, um, you know, you're not going to be able to control whatever happens this week with the base rate. Um, there will be considerable opportunities for property investors and landlords um, over the next couple of years, I would think. Um, and so absolutely getting the right knowledge and make sure you're completely clued up on everything. Yeah. But in, a, in the same breath, 
you have to look after yourself. Yeah. You have to remain agile. You have to take time out for yourself, which is why so many... Um, I mean, if, you're in, if, you, if you've gone out on your own, that's great because you can kind of make your own rules. But if you are part of a business like I am, then choosing um, a, a business to work for that offers you flexibility, offers you um, hybrid, hybrid working, um, it really invests in, in well-being and mental health is definitely the way to go. But you've got to force that issue yourself. You have to take care of yourself. You have to do something that makes you feel good and gives you breathing space so you can actually prepare to keep on going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the art of saying no yeah. as well sometimes, right? I think we can sometimes when you're, especially when you're starting out in something new, you want to say yes to everything. You want to go to every networking event. You want to meet all these new people and Sometimes you can get so overwhelmed yeah, that you end up not making the progress that you want, you burn out, and then you're kind of back to square one. So I do think saying no and really honing in on what is important to you, your why, as Marie said, and um, yeah, that will, that will definitely yeah. help. Lindy, I mean, you said about <laughs> planning before and how important it is. It's abs absolutely essential. Yeah. You need to be ready for as many possible eventualities as, as, yeah. as possible. We, you don't know what's around the corner. Mm. Um, so the more you can do, uh, the better prepared you will be. But yeah, you, yeah, you've got to look after yourself in the process. Or you're just going to burn out. Then you're no use to anyone, especially not yourself. Can I just add something to that? Mm. Um, yeah. I disagree with what you've just said. Because I think when you're starting out... You need to say yes to everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you this is the you other need end, to say yes sure. to everything. You just don't let it show with your clients. You know, I had three new clients that I had to see on Monday and Tuesday, and I had no time really to do it, but I didn't want to miss the instruction. So I said yes. The result of that, I'm in my office on Monday at quarter to one in the morning. And Tuesday, I think I left the 11.30. So I have a shop from people are going by and they must be thinking, God, look at her. Billy no mate, she's still in the office. Does she not have a house to go to? When you're starting up, you've got to say yes. Mm -hmm. You've just got to know what are your stress triggers. Yeah. You see, my stress goes in here. So you're not going to see it. Yeah, yeah, because you're not going to see in there. Yeah. But I know how to manage it. And the self-care, taking some time out for you is good. But COVID is great because before COVID, my office, there had to be somebody in there. All yeah. office hours every day. Oh, God, there's got yeah. to be somebody who's in there. Where are you? Da, 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 da. Yeah. I don't care anymore. We've created a sign. If we're not there, call us. You'll get someone. Mm -hmm. And these are the changes that you can make to suit you. Yep. But I think yeah. when you're starting out, and even when you're not, we're going to be in lean times. You need to say yes. And just think about how you're going to do it afterwards. Yeah. Your coat. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It is all about your capacity and what you're capable of. I totally agree. What about uh, from a law perspective then, Carly? Yeah, I have to say, I'm of the same ilk. I, when I started, um, for me, and it's interesting that someone you said about just taking that first step. Yeah. All I did when I started Woodstock, I didn't I ever anticipated I'd be a stand over there here today and have, you know, 30 plus of us. I just took that first step because I knew going back into traditional law firm was not an option for me. So it's about taking that first step. And yes, I have always been the sort of person that says yes to everything. Um, I'm getting more mindful of being, going, you can only do that for so long and you need to take a little breath and take some time for you. But I think you're right. Sometimes you just have to do that. You do have to just say yes. Um, really go for it. Um, for me in law, it's been incredibly challenging having my own business. I've got three small children, four, six, and eight. I started Woodstock when my first was born, and like I said, I just took that step forward, knowing going back in was not an option. And I grew that business bit by bit by bit. The business grew very fast, um, very exciting. My second one came along and um, realized there was no maternity leave, that was not a thing. Um, but, you know, I had a team around me, so I was able to take the right amount of time, but still focus on my business. Along comes number three, and the business is growing again, faster, uh, and I'm still wearing all those different hats. You know, I'm a lawyer, but, you know, I'm now running a business, and I'm doing the marketing, the HR, the accounts, and I remember 
my, you know, my third one coming along. It's my third child, so I've got half a clue of what I'm doing this time round. But I'm <laughs> sat there in my office with my team, with Jensen strapped to me, and I'm there. I'm the only one that can pay everybody. And if I'm not there that day, they don't get paid. The suppliers need paying. The team needed paying. And I was exhausted, but, you know, and I did it. And that was, it is challenging. Um, and I think one of the best things about running your own business and taking control of your career is the flexibility. Um, but that can also be the most demanding thing is where does, where does the scale tip the wrong way? And I have had times where it's tipped the wrong way and I've gone, ah, too much. I need to dial it back a bit. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's the biggest challenge, but the most rewarding thing. And it is worth it. And it's yeah. about getting, you know, the right time with family, but still being able to push forward for me um, yeah. and making sure that, you know, I do what I need to do for me and yeah. my business and my yeah. team. Absolutely. Yeah. So then, Marie, where are you going to be looking at investing in the next 12 months? We've had three prime ministers in three months, inflation rising, interest rates, you know, everything is a little bit crazy at the moment. What are you going to be focusing on and what's your strategy looking like? Okay, so I have no plans to invest in the next 12 months whatsoever. What I'm going to concentrate on is my existing buy to let. So I have a number of traditional Victorian terraces that are HMOs and I'm going to be looking at adding value to those, putting ensuite bathrooms in, doing refurbs but I'm going to take things into consideration because we've got a change in the EPC rates. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to need to make sure that those properties are up to scratch. Um, it's about keeping your eyes on your number. I'm not really interested in investing in residential properties, some commercial things I'm interested in, but I'm going to concentrate on what I have because I believe the market's going to get to a place where it's, it already is, it's un unaffordable in a number of parts of London. And therefore, I think if you have got very good quality HMOs with some en suites, you will get those rentals. And that's where my focus is going to be, not about buying anymore. Okay. I've got enough. Interesting. <laughs> and is that predominantly your area, London? Yes, that's always. All London. And freehold. That's only just by choice. The first property was a leasehold property. And I think with all the costs that go with leasehold, that was probably another factor that came into place. So I'm very much freehold properties Great. and convert. But yeah. that's what I'm going to do. Nice. Smart move. And not be stressed. That is one of the things. <laughs> don't, don't be stressed. You know, I want to tell this story, actually, because... When I first got my first property repossessed, my beautiful mum, and I, I was talking about this to her the other day, she is in her kitchen, it's about 22 foot kitchen, and I'm down one end and I'm putting some plates away. The banks were on me to pay the difference between what I owed. So they had already repossessed the property. And my mum said something to me. To this day, she can't remember, I can't remember, but it was nothing about me. It was just about the situation. Maybe, you know, you should sort of clear it up. I'm like thinking, I don't want them to make me bankrupt. I've got a company, I can't be bankrupt. But I remember I had this plate in my hand. I was putting it away. And I took the plate, my mum said something, and I hurled the plate in her direction. Me and my mum and my dad, we are like this, my beautiful late dad. But that's where stress gets you, yeah? You mm. get out of character, so don't get stressed. Okay. Right, we're in for hard times, but mm. we can manage it. Hold yeah. on. Brilliant. Well, I think we're slightly out of time, so we're going to run to a Q&A, if that's okay with everybody. Um, can we get some microphones? We do. Fabulous. If anybody has a question for our panelists, if you'd like to raise your hand, just this lady, thank you. Hello. Really informative. Thank you very much for the panel. Um, you mentioned about de-stressing and me time. I'm just wondering what you all do to um, de-stress and just find time for yourselves to do something different that uh, is good for you personally. Mine was retail therapy, but now with interest <laughs> rates going up, I'm learning how to cook. So I'm not going out to eat four times a week. So that, that's what I'm doing. I also retail therapy, and I have to stop that now. Um, <laughs> Um, Common denominator. But I play in my local tennis leagues 
So, and it's right behind my house, so I um, go to the tennis courts and smack the hell out of some balls sometimes, but um, it helps me a lot, and I also bake, so those are mine. Nice. I, I bake for anybody and anybody who will eat them, copious amounts, and I also, <laughs> I also sing and I tap dance. Nice. Not all at the same time, I hate to try. <laughs> <laughs> I like to see that. You don't do it while you're putting in the <laughs> oven. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, I'm, we're blessed. I live right on the south coast, um, down in Pool by Sandbanks, and it's beautiful. So if you're ever feeling stressed, there's no better place than uh, in the winter, I would say, when there's no tourists, for a nice walk down on a crisp beach. And even a dip in the sea when it's you know mid-December, there's nothing like clearing the head with that. Okay. Yeah, gorgeous. And for me, I walk. I go out in nature. Um, I like quiet time for me to de-stress. Mm. That's kind of my, my thing. Yeah. Uh, next question, lady over here. Hello, question for the panel and particularly for Marie. How are we going to work out the rising fuel costs and be fair to our tenants? Mm. Have we got any ideas what we're going to be doing well, about percentages or, or, you know, how are we going to go to the ones okay. that... Okay, all of my HMOs, in terms of the gas, I do have it come in on at a timer and I control it so it's locked. It comes on at specified times. There are council-run buildings where they do that. Yeah. Um, I, since the increase in energy costs, I haven't contacted my tenant. I need to have meetings with each household. So that is just something that I do at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I might have to look at reducing the hours that it comes on and just making them more aware mm -hmm. of not leaving electricity on in rooms. So maybe a few more poppers are going to go up in hallways and that sort of thing. We, okay. we deal with ours by, um, we're the same. We, we control out the gas um, and the remotely. Um, we also do seasonal newsletters to all of our housemates and so the last one has just been on en energy efficiency. Like, you know, don't put the tumble dryer on if you don't need to. You've all got air dryers. Um, can you just be mindful of turning lights off? We've got motion sensors on a lot of our lights in communal areas so there's no chance of them leaving lights on by mistake. Um, we know our housemates really well so we know who's what their working schedules are um, so that we can adjust the, the heating accordingly. And most of ours are actually, in, in all of our refurbs, we plan the energy efficiency so that we're adding as much um, energy efficient um, installations, if you like, into the houses so that, you know, we, we put 12 millimetre um, underlay in all carpets, for example, which actually makes a huge difference in terms of the... Um, the amount of heat that we actually retain within the buildings and we've got an idea like at the moment we're just about to start a refurb this is an ideal time for us to be able to spend maybe a little bit more now but it will save a lot of money yeah. in the long run thank you uh, any more questions could i, I just that add something to that uh, yeah, lady's sure. question yeah one thing that you need to be careful of with the energy bills if you are a company so you set up under section 24 and you're a company the energy companies are going to try start to treat you as a business so you haven't got miss marie paris on the bills you've got whatever marie paris limited so you need to be careful and think about these things and communication with your tenants you've got to level with them yeah. Let them work with you because otherwise the result is going to go up, the rent. There's no other way. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, great. Any more questions? I was just going to add to that if I can. Yeah, I just, sure. I know you're specifically talking about energy prices, but I think one of the key things to look at for you guys is the, the impact of the cost of living on tenants. And my best advice that I can give to you, we experienced huge amount of this when the pandemic hits. And I think, you know, traditionally, people expect as lawyers, we just want to rush you off to court. We absolutely don't. And what we did in the pandemic was in really encourage landlords to talk to their tenants and make sure they knew and understand what their financial situation was and see if you could come to a sensible commercial solution with them. So if they're struggling with their energy costs, if they're, you know, they're, you know, they're unemployed or anything, that you'll talk to them and see if you can come to a sensible arrangement. And, you know, we can work with you to do that. And we will do a huge amount of it, I feel, now with the cost of living um, crisis. And I think it's incredibly important. Yeah, you have these conversations definitely. early. Definitely. Yeah, very, yeah. very important. Can I just add to that as well? Just 
Um, echoing what you're saying there, just keeping the lines of communication yeah, open. If you've got lender, it, you've, you've got your mortgages or you've got your loans or bridging loans, development finance, whatever you're doing, yeah. just keep your um, lines of commu communication well and truly open because your, your lender will work with you um, to, to help you come to a solution um, that's, that's best for you. Brilliant. Yeah. Any final questions? No? I think we're all done for today then. Please do connect with us all on socials. And please, yes, put your hands together. Linda, Charlotte, Marie and Carly. Thank you so much.